Hey, it says wait, and then it fires up and off it goes. Hey, Sam here. Really love guitars. It's late-ish, so I'm not really going to do much today on this one. Well, tonight I'm going to get going with this. Um, what we've got here is Joe's Made in Mexico Telecaster. Sort of um, bog standard in many ways. And I've had um, a chance to look over this guitar and it'll be uh, let's just see if you can hear that I'm going to try uh, one more time up here um, yeah I'm going to get you right up close and personal yeah so what we've got is a basic excuse me a basic Fender made in Mexico Telecaster starting from that end Horrible metal string tree, Fender Tunas, um, nice maple neck. I think this nut, looking up close, this nut appears to have been reworked uh, from the original. It's very, very nicely done. The strings all sit perfectly on top, um, and you can see a couple of little starter grooves where it's been, the grooves have been off to one side. Um, so it's either the original that's been modified or a replacement. Um, either which way, it spreads the strings out quite a way, they're quite far apart um, with the result that there's not a lot of mo room down on the, the top end on the high E. Anyway, but nothing about it uh, is unpleasant at all. It's sort of, you can see the, hello Morris, you can see the, not the budget, but you know the, the finish here, uh, the, the fret ends are cut right to the straight flush with the end, so you can feel them. And they're a little bit sharp actually on both sides, so I'm going to do a little bit of smoothing that out. And then following it through we've got uh, a pick, couple of pickups which have been standard pickups come with a made in Mexico telly. Um, but they've been sunk quite low, both cases, the base end particularly far down, so somebody's preference is that. But um, I'm going to raise them back up for Joe. Um, standard chrome bridge and three-way switch, volume tone. And uh, just a few little tiny things that I've noticed about it. Um, first of all, is there's a kind of, what do they call it, lamination effect here. The, the, all the lacquer has got little stripes down it. And it is like the wood underneath is splitting or something. I don't know. Um, I don't know what they're, I'm not sure what they finish these with, but it has a, is it, it's mostly on this side here. And there's lots of little lines of, cracking of the lacquer or something um, I don't know if that's really what's happening yeah no in fact it goes all the way across people call it checking or crazing it's not really that not like a nitrocellulose finish um, it's it is on the front to a degree but not the same amount anyway it's not a major thing so they have it it's used it has a couple of dings in it it's been whacked. So what um, Joe sent it down for me is for a nice low setup. Um, it's not too bad as it stands, but there's a few things. Like I said, first of all, the pickups are, are all off. The positioning of the strings down the neck. I don't know how well you can see it here, but they're they're kind of running out of real estate down here on the high E. So I can realign the neck a little bit. Um, there's a little room for some lowering, um, but. Uh, We might get into fret problems once we go down a little lower. It's pretty good as it is, but we'll go a little lower. Um, there is some wear on the frets down here too, which um, a very light fret level will take care of as well. So, um, and, and Joe was saying that he he's losing some strength in the in the little finger on his left hand. So the lighter and easier the action, uh, the better. One of the things I noticed about this guitar. Um, when I first got it as well, is that they, even though it's well strung um, and the strings feel, sound like they've been on quite a long time, I was able to pull tons of slack out of them so the guitar was just going out of tune all the time. Um, so it's just one of those things that again points very much to the, the need to stretch your strings out. Um, otherwise you're just going to lose it in tuning, in slight detuning all the way through, which is a, a needless annoyance really. Um, what else about this? Oh yeah, listen to this. I don't know if you can hear it. 
There's, a, there's an amazing physical rattle going on down here. It's like a brrrr. Hear it. Something behind the... Something behind this pit guard is sympathetically rattling. It's amazing. Anyway, um, so I'll have to have a look under there. As it happens, we've got, um, you can hear a buzz actually, and this isn't seated properly. Ah, now, what did uh, Joe said? He said he noticed a bubble or something in the bubble? He said a bubble in the pick guard. He said a bubble. What did he mean by a bubble? I don't see quite. What I do notice is that's not flush. Or is it? Yeah, maybe it is. Yeah, he said something about a bubble in the pit guard, and I'm not, I'm not seeing what he saw, but maybe he means it's sticking up somewhere. But it's definitely something buzzing along. Anyway, I'm going to change this out for a black, a black one, black, white, black. Uh, while we're doing the setup, and at the same time, I'm going to change out the string, horrible string tree here for a tusk string tree. So a little white tusk one, or. You can really hear it. I hope you can. Check it out. Morris. It's a really funny thrumming vibration that goes through there. Anyway, as to this bubble in the pit guard, I don't really notice it, so maybe I'm, I'm not looking at the right thing. But there we go. So, uh, change the pit guard, change this string tree, um, set this up. It's, there's a virtually no, actually, in fact, there's almost no um, relief at all in the neck. So I'll put a little bit of relief in, set the action as low as it can go, and then do a very gentle fret levelling. It currently has 10s on here, so I'm going to need to find a set of 9s to do the setup with, because um, Joe wants 9s on it. But there you go. Um, yeah, so so you, miraculously, it will camera, camera will cut and it will be daytime and I'll be working on this. Goodly morning to the Welcome to another slow and ponderous guitar setup from really love guitars and um, in case you're somebody I don't like to have to begin with this but just in case you're someone who's wandered upon the videos on this channel and in case you make the mistake of thinking that my pr primary purpose for making them is your entertainment okay can I just tell you straight away you're wrong. It isn't. Right, that's the first thing I do need to tell you. Oh, I don't know why I don't use, why don't I use, why don't I put the amp there so it's always there and then why I don't, why I don't put the cap, hold on, I'm going to put the camera on the amp because quite frankly it doesn't matter which way up that is and it could do duty service. Ooh, what was that? Bits. <coughs> could do good service as a good, uh, thing stand. What do I need it to do? I'm just thinking about it. Yeah, anyway, um, while I fiddle, just um, yeah, in case you're thinking, you make the mistake of thinking I make videos for your entertainment, can I please tell you you're, mm, you're suffering from a misapprehension, all right? And I don't mean that in any unkind way. I, I hugely... Now I can't actually get to the controls there, but you know, something about that gives me a bit more of a, a downwardy kind of look on it. Well, maybe, who knows. Anyway, I will finish the sentence. In case some people make the mistake of thinking 
hold on, that I make these videos for their viewing pleasure. Um, and so they get cheesed off uh, when they discover, so I put that there like that. What happens if I do that? Hold on, I'm be with you in a second. They get cheesed off if they discover that they are long-winded and not edited and, and I rabbit on and on and on about stuff, right? That I feel like rabbiting on about. So some people get really fed up with it. And um, the truth is, the truth is, I'm moving a few things around here. The truth is, I don't make videos for your entertainment. And I, I don't mean that to be a, an insult. And nor do I mean it to suggest that I'm not happy that you watch them or that people find something useful in them or don't or whatever. That's not the point. The point is, and this is the point that some people, occasional viewers, find it difficult to get. Because I don't make it. I don't make them for your entertainment. So as a result, when, if and when you tell me the occasional viewer that tells me that they came here looking for a, a swift lesson and I could have taught them everything in that 10 minute video in one minute um, and they get really angry about it and pissed off um, they're coming from a point of view which is not reality the point of view they're coming from is their assumption about why people make videos the vibration on here is incredible. Um, yeah, it, it's it's this kind of limited thinking where they think that all media that they consume is made from the same point of view, which is I must, I the producer must entertain you, and and I must give you exactly what you want because you're the important thing. And if I don't, then you have a right to piss on my head from the height. Um, I don't make the videos for that reason. I make them for the reason of showing. Uh, this needs two string trees. This is not good. This is almost straight across the nut. Um, yeah, I don't make them from that point of view. I make them from the point of view of showing somebody like Joe, for example, whose guitar this is, to show him what I did with it. Um, and secondary, um, it's quite good for people who like the method I use to see how it works. So they may either buy my ebook or they may try that method themselves or learn something from it um, or they may send the guitar to me so <clears throat> those are the people who make the video well th that's the benefit for me of making the video nowhere on that list of motivations is entertaining you the traveling casual YouTube viewer and the reason that is is because it doesn't serve me any purpose at all not that I don't care about you um, but I also recognize that if you find it boring you can hit the back button and go somewhere else and find something shorter, snappier, or with more boobs, or whatever it is that, that you might want. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that's the freedom of, you know, viewer choice. Um, the stupidest thing of all is to spend 10 minutes constructing an insulting long paragraph to tell me how crap I am at showing you how to do something and how I've wasted your time. Um, you've wasted your time if this wasn't for you, okay? Not me. Um, so, Ciao. Anyway, here we are. Yet another of my real-time slow poke videos. So, welcome to Joe's Mexican Telecaster. And um, we had a quick look at it last night in the dark, and now I'm going to get get on with it. Um, what I've got here is I've got two string trees for this guitar and it didn't come with two string trees but I've obviously bought a pair of Tuskers um, which which will get rid of this massive pressure that exists. I don't know if you can see it. I've got a different camera angle so here you go. You look at the string tree on that. That is under a huge amount of pressure. I mean arguably that should have a little post underneath which it doesn't have so it's probably too far down. But one of the things that will do will it, it basically has no choice but to drag this um, metal, obviously this steel string, across this little metal butterfly wing thing um, and it just does end up causing some drag and some resistance and it and it's annoying and it can have a tiny impact on tuning but it's just annoying anyway because it ends up 
causing pinging noises and stuff. Now the Telecaster does need some sort of thing here because for some reason, the tele because of the way the Telecaster is, I don't know exactly why, but it tends to sing in reciprocal kind of harmonies, harmonics, if you don't have uh, string trees on it. Um, to, to basically dampen down this free length of string here. It starts playing its own note if you're not careful uh, when you strike a note here. So it does it does benefit from a string tree. I'm looking at this G and this G is, I mean I could put a straight edge on it to, <coughs> to sort of make my point to myself, but this G, I mean that's almost, that's, now there is a bit of a, a break angle but it's very very slight, relatively slight. I mean that's probably about th two to three degrees, which is not a lot. So arguably <coughs> you could put a second string tree in here. Um, You can sort of hear, I mean, you can hear the difference in the quality of the note. Open. This thing, and it's a different pitch obviously, but the string, unstring treed, if you, if you do play a game of lifting, <coughs> let's say we lift out this out of that angle. Now I'll use I'll use the tuner head to l levitate this. So you see, you see what happens when we get to a certain height. It's quite a good demonstration actually with the break angle. So uh, no break angle at all. Obviously it's, it'll it'll just play straight through. So hardly any break angle. Deadened. Sunbreak angle. More break angle. So it kind of feels like, looks to me like it needs it. That two degrees is not much. But then again, having said that, well, the G is the lowest of all. The, the, I would say that the, the A is about, I'm just guessing this, the A is about 10 degrees and the G is about three. Um, and I would say that the D is about four or five. But it's not a hell of a lot compared to these, which are somewhere in the sort of 15 to 20 degree angles, or 15 I'd say at least. <coughs> anyway, um, I'll have a look online and see. I'll, I'll go without it for the time being, but I may, I may check with Joe and consider putting the second one. Since, since Joe's paid for them here, they're two in a set, um, I think it would probably make sense. I know that Alex had two on his last week, so... Um, interesting, I had a little bit of feedback from Alex on his. I set it to an incredibly low... Shit! <laughs> oh, Christ! <laughs> I'll come back, come back to you now. <laughs> Live TV. Uh, of course it still works. Why did that do that? Is it... Is it? No. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the best stand. Anyway, um... Edit. Uh, yeah, a bit of feedback, uh, from email from Alex today. Um, he got his tally back with an immensely low action on it, as I, I kind of said on the previous video. Um, but it, he found it had a slight, slight choking out on about the 14th, bending up to the 18th, something like that. So um, I rec recommended the tiniest of upward tweaks on the E. But that's on that video. I talked quite a lot about the the law of diminishing returns when you have a 9.5 radius um, or a 7.25, any, anything 9.5 or below, around about 9.5, it, it does start to get difficult to have uh, an incredibly low action and get bends out of it because of the kind of geometry of bending from a low point slightly up a hill whilst the string is still coming back. Um, anyway, the bottom line is because of the, the because of the triangle that the string's making, that the, the actual clearance reduces the further up the hill you go to the crest of the hill, you're actually taking away the clearance. If the string was anchored here, you'd still have the clearance, but you obviously can't because you're bending it. So the further you bend up the hill, up the radius in 3D, 
up the hill. The further you bend up the hill, the smaller the actual free clearance is on the next fret because the next fret is in front of it directly, but his anchor point is down here in a lower plane physically, and, and so is its, its anchor point at that end. Anyway, <coughs> it's just one thing I found with, with guitars with 9.5 or below is you are on a kind of law of diminishing returns when it comes to fret leveling. And it's good to know because if you use this fret leveling technique or any fret leveling technique, actually no, this particular fret, if you use a standard technique you just go and that you live with what you've got. You put your strings back on you go well that's great isn't it or not and you adjust your action. With the technique I use it's good to know this piece of information because um, with this technique you could be tempted to keep on going at the action you set to try and get free up that bend but actually you have to recognize there's a point at which the action is so low you've set it so low that you will never get that bend freed up and you're forced to make a very small adjustment now Alex asked in his email you know could he make that small adjustment without affecting the beautiful playing action and the truth is yes you can because the amount you need to go up the, the clearances are so microscopic that the amount that you go up to clear it you just basically make quarter turns on the hex keys until you get the clearance you want and you'll find that it, it's imperceptible in terms of the playing action that's a nice thing about starting low and, and um, you know setting the, the underlying or leveling for a very low action is that if you still need to go a tiny bit back up you've you can go up without any sort of noticeable effect on the otherwise nice action um, anyway that was <coughs> that was covered in the previous video which isn't uploaded yet so uh, okay, so we're going to set up this Telecaster guitar and <coughs> um, we're going to realign the neck a little bit. This has got tens on it, um, and I know that. <coughs> excuse me. I know that um, Joe is going to want nines on it. Now the, tr the trouble with nines <coughs> is <coughs> that currently I don't have. Uh, I don't think I've got a sacrificial set of nines, and that's a bit of a pain because, certainly not not in the strat length. Um, the reason is I don't want to waste a set of nines to do the setup. Um, I'm just going to think what the difference is. Um, I'm just going to make. I never know these off off by heart. So we've got on the ten typical ten set. We've got ten, thirteen, seventeen, twenty-six, thirty-six, forty-six, and on the nine hybrids we've got nine, eleven, sixteen. 26, 36, 46, so that's hybrid in the lower regions. <coughs> and if I look, let's do a quick look online. This is going to interfere, I'm very sorry. Just going to do a quick search uh, on, I don't know, YouTube, eBay, no, Google. I'm just going to go Ro, Roto Sound. <coughs> Nines. Let's see what the gauge shows up as. Roto pinks. Oh, come on. Let me see the picture of it. Would you? Can I see it? All right. Nine eleven. Holy cow! Can I even see what it says? Oh, nine eleven sixteen twenty four. So the nines go nine eleven sixteen. Oh, sorry, twenty four. <coughs> Hold on a second. Sorry about that, see if I can do this again without throwing the camera on the floor. Right, on to that. Okay, so the nine, we go nine, eleven, sixteen. So the first three are the same as the hybrid nice, but they're different. Slightly different. Okay, well, uh, <clears throat> unless I can find me a nine set, I think I'm just gonna, it's gonna have to cost us an extra set. I don't, I don't like doing that, but <clears throat> you know, it's the price you pay. Um, I don't want to, uh, what are these, t t t 11s, no that's not good, I don't want to, um, I don't want to do it, I don't want to do the setup on the same gauge as the, uh, or on the 10s when, when we're going to um, make the guitar play with 9s, so um, let's see what this is running at, that's a nine. Okay, well these are nines, but I don't think they're going to be long enough. Let's see if we can get away with some of them. <clears throat> Anyhow, again, whether I'll get these through the body or not is another matter. That's that's the challenge of any any 
through body stringing um, you just you really don't get much of a go at it so I think this is gonna I might just get me there um, okay so while, while I'm talking I'm gonna need to restring this anyway so let's get these off and we'll save them off to one side for another another day sacrificial purposes um, yeah and these are done with a little twisty locking thing which makes it a little bit harder to get undone <coughs> anyway yeah so so a small amount of change on this guitar it's, it's not bad as it is but we're going to do a couple of things like I said yesterday we're going to realign the neck we're going to set it up with nines we're going to give it a clean obviously we're going to fret level to remove some of the fret wear and to to get a nice low or the lowest possible action um, but there's some some fret grooving here which we can get rid of it's mostly on the first second actually first second third fourth frets we'll clear that up we're going to just realign the the neck a little bit um, get the strings running right the way down the neck in the correct configuration this is where it gets difficult to undo um, and I'm going to change out the to to shoot them what are those things you know string trees um, put the tusk string trees on possibly two um, see what uh, make sure Joe's happy with two instead of just the one and then uh, I'm going to do the setup and once the setup's done I'm going to wait till tomorrow uh, when a new three ply black scratch plate should arrive and we'll change that over um, so I won't restring it today obviously so I'm going to use a set of strings first off <coughs> to um, we'll use one set to do the setup and then we'll take them off and I don't know it may be they're, they're in good condition and I can preserve them but the problem with it is, is by the time you've, you've wound them on you've got curls in the end and it starts to become very difficult to replace them that's as much of a consideration as anything else getting them off is not so difficult because you can just kind of put them under stress and pull them through like that and they straighten out <laughs> and then you but once they've got these coils in the end do you notice they just catch on every damn thing in sight um, including camera cables and stuff anyhow so yeah, so it's it's a fairly straightforward setup. Not this isn't going to be massive changes in how it plays, um, but the idea is to just optimize it for Joe, who's <coughs> um, lost some of the strength in his left hand for fretting. So it's just a matter of you know, can we get it as light as possible within the constraints of the 9.5 radius, which, as I've already mentioned, is. It's quite challenging, you know, the limits to what you can get in terms of lowness. Um, but at the same time, <coughs> it gives us an opportunity to just refresh the frets and remove that fret wear so it feels nice and fresh and new again. So these are Tele, tele Tens for a future reference. Tele Tens. body telly tens. Telly tens, uh, things hanging up everywhere but <coughs> okay so first thing to do uh, yeah I was going to have to I'm going to try and put these on wasn't I but I need to go off camera to bend these straight because it would just be very boring otherwise but what I'll do before I do anything else I'll hold the camera base this this really is rock and rolly I'm afraid that's not a good idea I'll find something else to achieve the same thing but from way overhead I'm just going to remove this horrible string tree and stick stick as a nice not as extreme angle by any means uh, tusk one on for now and then we'll consider a second one when the timing is right uh, choice of black or this uh, sort of whitish 
slightly off-white colour on these string trees and I went for the white because of the majority of white and I know the black the pit guard's going to change um, but I still think probably white at this end with the, the blonde uh, fingerboard probably works best anyway see you in a second when I've straightened these strings out um, um, ooh, this is wobbly while I'm at it I've got a couple of old strings here that are struggling to get through um, thought I'd show you the little trick that somebody suggested but if you if you're trying to fit an old string with a bit of a curve to it into the through body stuff and you can't get it get one of them very small shrink wrap shrink tubes tubes push it through till it comes out the other side <laughs> obviously it's got to go through from the front because you've got to remove it from the front there's no point shoving it through the back and you're left with it still on so a string comes through take the thing off oh yeah now this is a, a combined oh, it's 11s but it came off an oak caster so that's not going to work I'm, I'm putting together a set <coughs> I'm short on an 11 and I'm short on literally I've got a 9 but I've got, I'm missing an 11 so unless I've got one peeking about in the spares department I'm going to have to compromise. Compromise? I'm going to have to cheat with a 10 or something. Um, I've got a bag of bits. Of, oh, hang on. There's a full size 11 up there. Ah, I thought I got some more. I sorted out quite a few things the other day. So in here, I've got something with 11 written on it. Yeah, whose idea was this? <coughs> 11s. Nine, there you go. An eleven and a nine together. That will do. Put them there. Good. Always good to keep your spares handy. This this does away with the need now for the uh, tubing. But that's also that's a good a good little trick for those times when you you've got a pre-bent crimped piece of wire, and no matter how much you do, how hard you work with your players as I've just done you just can't get it through um, because it just won't line up with the hole basically <clears throat> so anyway here we go this I'm just I know I'm being over precise here but this feels like a 10 no it's a 9 okay so I was just about <clears throat> ready to do some tweakings from the start um, getting this Strummed up, obviously. Problem with having spare sets, they come off different sort of size, different length guitars, so a lot of mine come off either a Les Paul or an Oak Caster. I hate this bloody thing. Note to self, get a new thing. Rest. Um, yeah, the strings either come off a variety of different things, so quite often they aren't long enough to put back on the telly or a strap, which on which the, e, the B and the E are uh, further away than <coughs> on other things. Um, but once you've got a whole load of strings kicking around like I have, you usually can get a set from somewhere as a sacrificial set, just to save throwing five quid uh, down the drain on a sacrificial set from new. Anyway, because these are just going to get chucked shortly. So the idea is to, uh, I'm going to sort of talk this through as if you haven't seen any of my other setups, which there's no reason to assume you have. Um, I really love guitars setup method. I can just get this to ride on. The really love guitar setup method is aimed at a low light action every time um, and it's based the, the kind of the thing that it's all based on is is I don't offer a light L-I-T-E bronze cheap <coughs> inexpensive budget setup right? and the reason I don't offer a budget light cheap low cost setup is that in all the setups I've done which is more than probably about 450 coming towards 500 um, it's always been the case that I've 
just about, I would say 98% easily of guitars, electric guitars, or guitar, all guitars have uneven frets. And basically it's the uneven frets in the guitar that dictate how low your action can go. So they, they are what dictate the playing, the basic playing action. So the point being um, is that if you think about it, it's inherent in the method of fretting. Um, it's just metal strips pushed into wood and glued or hammered in place or whatever methods used <clears throat> and the point is it's nothing to do with brand or anything like that the the unevenness is just a, uh, a byproduct of the the basic mechanicalness of that process Yeah, it's basic product byproduct of the mechanicalness. Um, unless you've got some sort of kind of prototype experimental guitar, you know, made with. There's a fantastic one made with a, a, a stainless steel bar with frets that just sort of stick up, and there's no fingerboard at all, and it just works off the frets. Stuff like that. That's different. But a, a basic frets in wood guitar like this is is made with. Um, oh, I've got something to do first. It's made with. Um, same kind of basic process, pushing frets into wood and gluing them or, or holding them in with tangs. So the problem is that the, the geometry of a guitar means that the clearances, when you fret a note, the clearances are minuscule. The higher the action is at this end, the bigger the clearances are wherever you, at any point where you fret it, the clearance to the next fret and the one after and so on is always a, a triangle and it's always increasing as you move away from the fretted string, providing that the bridge is taller at this end has a certain amount of height. If it's flat then you, they, all the strings will hit the frets and you won't get a note. But assuming that you've got a certain amount of height on your bridge, the, the clearances as you move away from the fretted note are tiny on the first fret and they increase over, you know, as an as a increasing angle if you like, as you move further away. And the clearances are tiny and they get more or less depending on how high or low your action is on your um, on your bridge. If it's a very high action you've got quite a lot of clearance from the very first fret and it just increases from there. Now that's great for masking or, hi or hiding the effect of any underlying uneven frets and that's why most uh, electric guitars you'll get second hand will have a fairly, tend to have a fairly high action because it will be set at the point at which a previous owner has tried to lower it, um, found that some uneven frets in here interfere with the clearances, um, block the clearances or, or cancel out the clearance that you need to make the note ring and then uh, to regain that clearance they've had to raise the action back up and that's then they tend to stop wherever they can get the notes playing. Um, you've got to remember that the, the, the dimensions and the, and the actual measurements here are minuscule, they are tiny so that um, a note that's choking here can be choking because of a you know one hundredth of a, a actually possibly a hundredth or a thousandth of an inch and possibly a tenth or a fiftieth of a millimeter. It's, you know, tiny amounts. So that a tiny gentle amount of fret leveling can re, um, or to give you, it can reacquire, give you back the clearances you need or to the, uh, alternatively, a tiny uh, adjustment in height down here can give you back the clearance you need to make the notes play. Now, obviously, like I said before, most guitars, when you don't do fret leveling, are set to a kind of the best action you can get whilst avoiding the underlying uneven frets. Um, people often say, well, why aren't the frets made absolutely level in the factory and, and don't custom shop guitars or, you know, expensive Gibson have perfectly level frets? Um, 
there's a whole set of discussions about yes why they do or they don't and some there are some fancy machines and so on um, my experience is that even some that have been leveled by expert people um, there's kind of two basic ways of leveling frets. One is with the strings off and the neck flattened and you, you go for an absolute levelness of all the frets, which is massively more effective than not doing it at all. Um, but that's the bit that um, most techs charge as fret levelling or fret dressing and that's they will charge that completely separate from their £50 setup. They'll charge £100 or £75 or whatever for fret levelling. Um, and so the whole thing together becomes a kind of exotic setup um, but the reason the reason I don't offer the light or cheap setup is that if 98% of guitars arguably have uneven frets and if just about every electric guitar you've ever come across has the action set as low as it can go without running into the problems caused by the, those uneven frets and you give it to me already at that point what's the point in just taking the strings off polishing the frets cleaning everything up putting new strings on tweaking the neck a bit and giving it back to you so that it essentially feels the same or possibly even worse if I've made an alteration that's unfamiliar to you but but I haven't improved your overall playing action what's the point of giving it back to you and charging you 50 quid for it as simple as that so um, based on my experience that's why I pretty much do a fret level in every single setup if it doesn't require a setup then suddenly my setup becomes cheap or inexpensive but it's the very very much the exception it's one one in a hundred that's already there and often that can be the case that sometimes a factory has a process that just happens to get the fretting just spot on um, for one reason or another or possibly even more likely uh, it means the guitars already being leveled by someone else but the two methods that I was mentioning one is the passive neck flat strings off get everything level using a straight edge and, and a straight file um, which is great and it's much better than not doing it at all Luthier will charge you 75 to 100 quid or something for doing that on top of your setup um, the, the, the other method is one where you put the neck under load with the strings on fully tensioned and the neck you dial in the amount of curvature some curvature that you need in your neck a little bit uh, and then you level the frets with that curvature and with the strings loading the neck now you might say what the hell first of all how the hell can you do it and why would you do it the first one how do you do it is that you curve your fret leveling tool to match the curve in the neck Dun. why do you do it curved well you don't care about it being curved what you care about mosquitoes what you care about is it being um, under load which the other method doesn't have and the under load seems to put a longitudinal compression force on the neck which makes the frets do slightly different things and changes the clearances just ever so slightly than if you relax the neck, flatten it, level the frets relative to each other then load up the neck again with strings, reintroduce the horizontal longitudinal compression um, which then makes what was, what was relatively completely level when you did it with the strings off actually then becomes just slightly less than perfectly level when you put the compression back into it by virtue of the force of the strings. So it's that missing compression effect that the conventional method doesn't factor in. And there are a number of other reasons why the curved strung method is more effective and you'll see them, you might work them out as we go through, but anyway. So that's why I always do fret leveling and that's why my setups are not budget or cheap. They are uh, pretty much all one price because I do the same thing each time um, because my aim is to give back a guitar that is noticeably different um, not just the a bit cleaner new strings and oh look he's tweaked my truss rod a bit so the first thing I'm going to do on this guitar having just thought about it while I was talking is I'm going to realign the strings on the neck and I'm going to use I'm going to use a simple method of slacking the strings off um, a bit for now. I know I've just tuned it. But I'm going to take the pressure off the strings for a second and I'm going to undo the screws on the back. I don't want the strings completely slack. I want to see, I want to be able to see where things are, are but I'm going to I'm watching out I don't tip this camera off again, which I probably will in short order. I'm going to um, give myself some torque and I'm going to take 
all but one of these screws out. Begin with holding holding the neck so it can't go anywhere. And applying a forward force at the same time. So that skips. Okay, so these are pretty much all the way out. They're not going to be biting at this distance, they're going to be free of the neck. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to slack this one, the final one, off slightly. And the idea is when you have not enough real estate on the E string, is I'm going to take this and you can move it that way or you can push it the other way. And this one requires me to pull the neck a little bit towards me. And it's a tiny amount, but it's going to be just enough. And what I'll do for that whilst keeping it, I'm going to get myself a block just to protect the or foam pad actually. Just protect the end of it. I'm just going to gently press that against there. Now, the problem with this is I'm on the wrong side, but hey, there's my thingy. I'm going to turn, turn the torque the other way around. I'm just going to make sure now I'm going to put this under a little bit of pressure, pushing the whole arrangement down on that neck. And I'm going to re redo. This other one out here, and that pulls the neck in, and then I'll pull that one in. So, dropping my drop my block, I'm just now going to look. And this is uh, I'm just going to tighten this a second, just make sure. Yeah, that's, that has just pulled back. It's not a lot of room because this is very, this is very actually very snug fitting. So it's 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 that's good in one sense. But I've just I've just given it back half three quarters of a millimeter um, more room and that's just what I want to do so it's just a tiny bit of pressure and then tighten up the other two and I've got a torque setting on my screwdriver of about six here which is just enough for this job and then the final one there so then just look at it again um, we, we, if we had any more movement room wiggle room in there we we could try for a little bit more. I, I don't think, to be honest, I don't think there's any there's much room. I might try it one more time from a slightly different angle. Um, but I don't think we're going to get much more than that because of the straightness of this fit. It's a funny one because on my own, my own guitars I aim for a totally airtight fit. Which with the combination of the um, the uh, threaded inserts that I used, that really doesn't give you any um, it doesn't give you any sort of bend room of the neck. And uh, I'm just trying to think of a way I can do this. I don't want this to go I'll press down. Let's see if I can just use a bit of downward force on here. Yeah, so I don't get I don't give myself any adjustment room in that respect. Um, whereas on this one, on a, a telly or a strap. There is a bit more wiggle room. Right, let's just have a look at this one. Let's see if we. Yeah, that's about as good as it's going to get. Yeah, I'll go with that. Okay, so say if if there's a bit more room that way, then then you get that adjustment room. If it's dead flush there, you can't really press much more. You could kick out the end there just slightly. Um, which is kind of what I'm trying to do a bit, but we could you could start with that screw. But this is so close, this one I'm not going to I'm not going to jump screws. Put a little shim in one corner just to ensure that it doesn't pull back in. But if we can do it without a shim, I, I prefer to do that. Um, yeah, that's not bad actually. That's just uh, that's a fraction better than it was before. Good. I'll live with that. Yeah, I mean, if you if you absolutely had to, you could instead of slacking that one, we could slack that one, put a shim in that corner there so that it's it's no way it it can't ever pull back in flush. So it'll sit slightly that way, and we get that little bit of extra. But um, I'm happy with it and the way it's adjusted here. I I had a feeling that this neck. Uh, this nut to begin with was a, a custom nut built with a bit of extra playing width. Could be wrong, but it seems quite all the way close. 
I mean, it's a, it looks like a custom nut because of the material and the way it's been cut. Uh, there's a couple of little sort of starter grooves in here that have not been continued. Okay, I'm happy with that. Okay, <clears throat> what I'll just do while I'm here, I'm just going to do a bit of a tiny little hand tight and turn on each of these screws just to make sure it's a little bit more than the, the torque on the machine, which isn't a measured setting. <clears throat> I just do it as a sort of a known arbitrary setting that I use. Okay, good. So a couple of other things that I can do straight away that I know that Joe wanted. One of them is to raise these pickups um, for starters because they're, they're way down low. This, this looks to me to have been set by somebody who wanted to reduce the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the base on there, or the base notes on their uh, pickup or base output. So they've reduced, they've lowered it down at one end more than the other. Um, I think the same applies to this one, it's very low down at this end. But I'm going for the sort of three millimeters below the held string at its lowest point. Uh, these strings and uh, these screws are never easy to reach on a telecaster. Lift the front of this up. We'll hold off there for a minute. Actually, that's a little bit low still. <coughs> okay, I'll just stick there for a minute. Okay, so <coughs> pick guard to change yet and find out what's buzzing behind there, we'll leave that. One string tree on. This nut, uh, apart from being, I think, custom cut or certainly custom shaped, it's also been cut and the action, first fret action set pretty well. It's a little higher on the toppy. It's a little bit uneven, but somebody's gone nice and low with it. They've, they've certainly made it feel quite playable at this end. Um, I'm gonna see what the lowest of lows are, but I do it in sort of combination. So I'm just gonna, first of all, check the, the neck relief on this, which I know at the moment was flat and now we've gone from tens to nines there's absolutely zero give or zero curvature in that so I am going to add some curvature some relief because it needs a little bit um, so to do that I'm going to I can see if I can reach that I'm going to, if I can reach it, slack it off a little bit. So it's difficult to get a proper bite. Now you don't know whether you've got one that's too big going in there or too small. Every guitar has a different bleeding size. Now that could be the right size but too short, in which case I'm going to need another thing which is attached to here which will end up with me dropping the whole thing on its arse again. And then you've got a string in the way before you actually get any biting. Hmm. It's always difficult to get a feel for what you're actually doing. There's there's, there's um strings and stuff in the way. That's that is too loose. And then the other one is more the right size, but it's too short. This one is the same as that one, so that won't fit. Yep. And those. This one seems like it fits, but I can't get any grip because it's too short. In oh no, there we go. <laughs> Finally get it. 
So I'm going to just slack it a little bit, a couple of eighth turns there. Um, and what I'm looking for is to see, there we go, a little bit of space opens up. Now, how high that is, about 0.2 of a millimetre, and you can do the check if you want. I'm not very, I'm never precisely accurate in judging this. Um, it's quite difficult to see what happens when you put that in and does it move the thing or does it sl slot in without moving it? I would guess that's it's probably 0.15 but I'm going to start with that. So there's a little bit of curvature in the neck that it didn't have before. Chin, let's get another note out of it in a second. Let's see if I can switch this on from where I'm standing here. Oh, these Roland's, I tell you what, they've got the most stupid on and off switch. That's the, uh, that's the only thing I don't like about them. So that may or may not change around. Can I reach it from here? Where is it? There. Um, the, the curvature of the neck may adjust slightly as um, over time. It, it, sometimes the truss rod takes, or the action takes a surprising amount of time. It's hard to predict. I've lost my plectrum again. It's trouble with having a white one. There it is. Okay, so let's, let's, um, that's very, very slight, but let's, let's start with that, okay, and what I want to do now <coughs> is I want to measure the playing action, I can also, by the way, have a look at the height of the string over the first fret at this point, so I'm just going to check, now typically I would be aiming for 3, but I uh, sorry, 0.3, and I suspect some of these are there, that one, Just about on, just about on, just about on, and then the B is lower, and the E is just above. So I have a feeling that the action lowest common denominator in this lot is going to be about 0.25. So in which case I will now do a slight adjustment there because I want to make sure that these are all equal or evens. I've like got cobwebs. I haven't done a setup for a day or two. So I'm going to go above the gauge quoted. So for a 9, I'm going to definitely go 11. For an 11, I'm going to go 13, and so on and so on. Now the reason I do this is because I found out the hard way over many, many setups that going the same gauge, first of all, guarantees you uh, 16. I'm going to go, I want 17, but I really want more. Uh, going the same gauge almost guarantee, well, guarantees you sticky, you're going to get sticky um, strings, they're going to get stuck in the slots. 24, 26, I'm, 24, I'm going to go 32. Um, so it just makes no sense at all going the exact same gauge. You'll just end up with trouble and you'll end up having to constantly sandpaper your way out of trouble. Or play, try and play with sticky uh, let's go 28. Sticky strings, in which case it will never stay in tune and you'll hate the guitar and so on and so on. So if you're going to cut slots, cut them over to begin with. Of course the other thing is it gives you a bit more, I'm going to 36 now, uh, it gives you a bit more room in case you want to go up a, a, a gauge. In fact, you could safely cut for 10 and above. Let's let's do it that way. Let's let's not even be cautious. Let's go, let's go 10. We'll go, uh, we'll go 9, we'll go 13. I'll show you just how, how important it is to go over size. 13, we'll go 17. Uh, 17, we'll go 24. 
26, we'll go 32. Sorry about that's gone. 26, 32. See, it's quite a bit over, but it's a tiny amount still. 26, we'll go 32. 36, we'll go 42. Wherever it's gone. Oh, hellfire. Come on. 42. 42. And then 46, we'll go 48, which is squeaky type. Right, so this is, you could argue this is two gauges above the strings we're going to be playing on here. All right. But this is, you'll, you'll see it works, and you'll see that it's one way of making sure that we don't end up with sticking strings out of tune. So remember I said that the common denominator on this is 0.25. And all I'm going to really do in this case is I'm going to take the pointed file and I'm just going to gently ensure that this is wide enough. That's really all I'm doing because it's almost... I'd say that's at, pretty much sitting at the right height as is. And you can check by listening for the note to play. It's almost playing. Um, and that's just on the mark for me. Um, but I've just had enough you know, to make sure that it was wide enough. So I'm just going to make sure this is a, a pitch as well. Not for the pitch part of it, but for the tension. Um, you want it at the correct tension. So that's just a hair's breadth over, and again, this is I'm going to run this in here more from the perspective of widening the slot than cutting downwards. I don't really want to go any lower. We're on the mark there. Just those two, and then we we'll go for the last one. Again, tune up. And this one, this one, a little bit higher. So we got tiny bit more room on here and again it's mostly about width so it's just I just want to kind of see, get it moving in there and we'll just widen it a little bit so you can see the gap you can feel the gap you can hear the gap so you can just very gently work with this now for those if you're new to this and you haven't wonder why I'm taking so much time to get such a low action of the first fret is that you'd be surprised that most of, not most, a, a very big part of the feel of a guitar like this or any guitar, electric guitar, the feel of the action isn't just, doesn't just come from the action at the bridge end. <sighs> this reminds me of Wales every time I say that but a very large part of the feel comes from the action at this end. That's one thing. So if you want a, a very light, low feel, you can make a huge adjustment or a huge amount of difference by a relatively small adjustment at this end. Um, and my target action I aim for here is 0.3, although I'm aiming for 0.25 here because it, it can tolerate it, but also the guitar is kind of the nut has already been cut that low on one of the um, one of the strings, but a very low action like that over the first fret. There you go. Gives you a very light feel on playing bar chords and notes down at this end, um, and perhaps even more importantly, as you're doing this part, you get to you get to set the um, the first fret action you want, so you've got this very light feel. But in doing this work, you, you'll see that I'm also widening the slot to make sure that we begin with the strings running smoothly through and there's no sticking. And that's a really important part of setting the nut correctly. So it's as much about getting the width as the depth, or both together. Um, and, and the other benefit of this um, and this will change too when I put this under a second string tree tension. Okay, a fraction more. Um, the other significant benefit about doing getting your nut slots right is that if I've found through experiences, if the if the nut if the first fret action tends to be much above half a mil, half a mil or more, uh, anything above half a mil you get increasingly sharp notes when you fret notes at that end of the neck. 
because you're having to press a long, quite a long way to fret them out. Now, some people also say, hey, if you've got jumbo frets, the same applies. You press it and you can then keep on going down because the fret's so tall. That's true, you, you, you can do that. The problem with a high first fret action here is you don't have a choice. You can't actually, if you've got too high a first fret action, you physically can't make the note without having already bent the uh, string quite substantially sharp. So it's slightly different. Um, I would agree that um, playing with ultra high jumbo frets is an issue of technique, but if you're not careful with high jumbo frets, you can get sharp notes when you play. Um, when it comes to the high first fret action, you don't have any choice. You, your technique won't save you. If you, in order to fret, if you've already had to bend the string down substantially to meet that first fret, it's got nothing to do with technique. You can't even meet the fret without making the note go sharp. And that's what you get when it's 0.5 or substantially more. If you go up to, the, the differences are huge. If you go up to 0.75, you can hear those notes going sharp down here. If you go to, um, you go to a millimeter of the first fret, which a lot of budget guitars come set like, and some not so budget as well, like Gibson's often, um, you, you'll find that those notes will be massively sharp. And you, you, the experience for the player actually is, I can't get my guitar in tune. It won't stay in tune, or it's not playing in tune. Um, and actually it's, the truth is it's an intonation issue caused by poor, badly set up nut. <laughs> Um, and it's, sh it's, it's actually a, a complete disgrace that a $2,000 or £1,500 or a £1,000 guitar should come out of the factory like that. Or make it past a retailer like that, but they do. Um, and I, I know Gibson tried to, uh, tried to put that right with this adjustable brass nut thing that they fitted. And it's a great idea, um, only somebody who had one the other day just told me that it was a good idea, but the actual radius of the unit wasn't even the same radius as the guitar, which kind of makes a mockery of going to that trouble. So you see here, I'm, I've still got clearance over this B, and I'm going to keep on working it, even though it, it's very close to the mark. Um, but I want the width, and I want it exactly on 0.25, if that's what I'm setting for the others. You can hear the notes still playing, so I'll do it some more. Um, yeah, so I often say the biggest adjustment you can make on your guitar for the smallest amount of money, but, but takes precision, is to make the first fret adjustment like this. Um, because not only does it cure, it makes your action really light in a way, in a way that you'll notice straight away. It also cures your tuning problems if you do it right. Um, it's 50% of any possible tuning instability. And then it also cures your potential uh, um, intonation, sharp notes played near the nut problems, which you may not even notice as that, but you may be experiencing as I can't get this guitar to play in tune. And that's the hard part about it is, unless you know what's happening, you will, you will describe it as guitar won't stay in tune or it doesn't sound in tune or I can't seem to get it in tune and describing it like that and then going online to various forums etc is almost never going to get you the answer you need because it isn't a, strictly speaking it's not a tuning issue as in the things that people usually attribute tuning to and of course the the thing is that what people normally attribute tuning to is also usually wrong. So when you go to any forum and they they say, "Oh, I can't keep my my guitar doesn't stay in tune," and they go, "Well, buy buy these really fantastic tuners. <sighs> They're much better, and they'll keep your guitar in tune." And actually, it, it has nothing to do with the tuners. Almost precisely nothing. And it's very hard for people to believe that because we've been trained to believe that. You know, crappy open tuners are, by definition, there you go, crappy and won't keep the guitar in tune, but it's not the case, they will. And the tuning stability has zero to do with them and everything to do with uh, your nut slots and the amount of unreleased slack in your strings.
which this guitar came with tons of that. Okay. We're slightly out of tune again, Let's just get it into tune for tension's sake. Might, might as well. For now, it's not in tune, but it's close enough. Um, so, interestingly, for those who can be bothered or care about it, the reason I did the truss rod first is um, for a set gauge of strings, I want the guitar to have some curvature in the neck. Whatever it's doing, I want it to have some curvature in the neck. So, I set that amount of curvature first, then I will set the nut slots. Um, you could set this end first or set the nut slots first, either way. If I set the nut slots first, um, I know that this end, making an adjustment, will bring that clearance down a tiny fraction. Likewise, having set the gap here, I also know that doing fret levelling next will take a hair's breadth off these and increase the angle too. Likewise, I know that when I finally put it upright and play it in this position, that too will increase the clearance just very slightly. So, for those who get really freaked out about doing things on the back, and I keep saying time and time again on these videos, just know what gravity does. You don't have to perform, jump through hoops to some sort of dogma, right? If I say 0.25 here, I know that by the time I've leveled the frets, taken a bit of material off, plus set the guitar up like this, I know that's going to be, if you put a laser beam on it, that'll be 0.3. I don't care. What I know is that doing that and then this leads to a nice action, okay? And that's what you should be chasing, the end result, not the figures along the way. Okay, if, you, if I did it all standing up, the figures I start with would be slightly different. Um, I'm starting, I'm doing it this way, and I know I'm, I'm conscious of what gravity does to the neck. I know to some degree it's going to uh, just slightly take the gravity off this headstock. Even though it's supported in the middle, there'll still be, you can do it. If you want to, if you want to prove it, you can get your tuner out and play that note, even with support, and then play this note. It will be tiny fraction lower. Reason? Gravity's bending it and tightening the note, okay? Okay, so just be aware of what it's doing. So anyway, the, the thing is, I set the um, amount of relief I want, and some people get really upset about that because some people think that the, um, the truss rod is about is what you do to adjust your playing action. and. And then I'm, I say in my videos, it isn't about, it isn't what you use to set your action. And then people misinterpret that and they go, that guy says the truss rod, adjusting the truss rod doesn't affect your action, which is crap, right? A coarse truss rod adjustment affects your action, okay? It's a, but it's a secondary effect of what you're aiming for. It's not the reason, okay? If you want to change your action on the guitar for how it feels, adjust it via these two things, right? The first fret action and the last fret action via the bridge. Then dial in, or as I did, do it first, dial in the amount of curvature your neck, you think your neck needs for the strings to move at their centre point, okay, or in the centre of the neck. Because that's what curvature in the neck is for, it's for room for the string, it's not for any other reason. The fact that it increases the height from the fret in the centre of the curving neck, or the part of the neck that curves, is a secondary effect of you dialing in a small, or it's a primary effect, if you like, but it's your purpose, your, your agenda is to set a gap here that will give your strings some room to move, right? The fact that it raises the action as far as you feel it is concerned or contributes to the overall feel of your guitar is, is a secondary thing you do. In other words, if you pick up a guitar, the way of thinking is dead simple. You pick up a guitar and you go, God, it's hard to play. It's really high. The strings are miles off the deck. You don't primarily go and tweak your truss rod to try and address that. What you do is you try to reduce your bridge settings or your last fret action as I call it which is adjusted by the bridge and you try to reduce your first fret action which is adjusted at the nut. Okay? Now those two things make the huge difference to the playing action. Right? Don't, if you try and, uh, try and dial out a high playing action here right, by tweaking your truss rod 
Okay, yeah, you might just be able to flatten it out enough so it reduces it a tiny bit up here, but actually up here it's going to have the least difference. It's going to be more of an impact if you're trying to adjust your action only using a truss rod. The major impact is felt in the middle. For the same reasons, you could set a fantastic low action here and here, but if you mess up and get yourself too big a curve, a beautifully lowered action can actually feel really high somewhere around about here because you've got half a millimetre too much curvature in your neck to begin with. Now, yes, you can play with a flat neck, but I guarantee you it'll mean that you probably have to have a higher bridge action because the flat neck will bring the irregularities of the uh, uneven frets closer to your strings, okay, and therefore reducing those clearances. Um, so I recommend that you adjust your truss rod in order to mainly set the amount of space to allow your strings to rotate at the middle of there, well, somewhere near the middle. The truth is, you can see straight away that the middle of this curving neck is here, but the middle of these strings is here, so they're not even aligned, so it's imprecise, okay? when. You hear somebody, if you hear even me saying, you know, where the string spins most at the centre of its travel, well it's not. The centre of the string's travel is there, the centre of the curving neck is there. So those two curves will forever be misaligned, unless you make your own guitar like that one over there, where they are identical and exactly the same place. Secret. Anyway, um, so the point is, don't be fooled. You do not address the difficulty in your playing actions first and foremost by tackling your truss rod. Yes, adjusting your truss rod makes an overall difference to your playing action, but it's a sort of secondary effect of why you're adjusting your truss rod. You want to adjust the truss rod to make sure there's a little bit of curvature so that your strings have some room near the center, near the center of their travel to spin, which they do, okay? Um, you want to adjust your playing action by doing the two things that you're going to see me do. First one, by setting this overall um, neck curve to a very slight curve to begin with, then reducing your first fret action to a really low and light thing whilst cleaning out the, the nut slots so that your tuning is stable and the strings move freely backwards and forwards. And then the next bit, which I'm going to do now, which is to get your, uh, adjust your um, bridge saddles to give you the last fret action that you want your guitar to have, ideally. Now, this is the three, three bits of the equation, okay? There's a slight curvature to begin with, not with the view of setting your action, but to give your strings a tiny bit of room to move, right? Otherwise, they'll be too flat, the neck will be too flat, and it will limit how low you can set your playing action. And the, the reason, basically, if you think about it, the reason there is a truss rod is that when you put a wooden neck under load of the strings, it's always going to go like that. The truss rod's purpose is to push it back and with resist the, the pull of the strings. Now, you know, the only question in it, right, it's not there to adjust your action for the sake of how it feels to play. The, the purpose of the truss rod is to counter the pull of the strings to a degree, an optimum degree. And the question is, what's the optimum amount of curvature? Is it? Well, it's not humped because you'll never play the guitar. It, I argue it's not flat, right? Because although it feels great, it, you'll, you'll find your strings hit the frets too quickly. It's a little bit of curvature, ideally, to allow you some the string some spin room in the middle. But it can be as low as you like, okay? But not flat and not her, not completely flat and not humped. Right? So that's the purpose of the truss rod, is to, is to have some control over what the, what the loading of the strings does to the curve in your neck. If you didn't have the truss rod, you just end up with a neck that curves as much as whatever gauge of strings you've got. You know, 13s, 9s, 8s. Okay? Um, so we set that first, then I go and adjust this to where I want it, notwithstanding gravity and the fact that fret leveling is going to remove a little bit and then we come to the last part of the three bits of the equation and that is in the way I do it and you can do it any way you want uh, is to check out what the action here is on the last fret and it's currently just over two millimeters now I like a 1.5 down to about one point well normally on a, an electric I could go 1.5 down to on a gradient down to one on a 9.5 radius Telecaster or I should say a 9.5 radius anything it's actually not that easy to achieve, 
because the 9.5 radius doesn't um, the tighter or the more curved the radius is, the more difficult it is to, um, or the, the, the harder it is to get a really low action without the strings choking. Okay, so let's see what we get out of this now. I'm going to take this down to a sort of heading for my nine, my um, 1.5 heading for one. Now I'm not going to try and do a curve as such, I'm, I'm going to try and keep these feet level, I prefer to do it that way. The blocks make a curve as they go across, but we don't try and tilt one, put more load on one foot than the other. I, pr I prefer it goes, rather than, if you get what I mean. You still get the same effect either which way, but it just spreads the load onto two feet instead of putting all of it on one, which will dig a bigger hole on one side. So I've got 1.2, 1.3. Not enough quite there, we're just down a little bit on the middle. Um, that will go to just under 1.4. Tiny bit up on this one. Yeah, that's coming in at one point, just under 1.5, and then runs to about 1.5. So a tiny bit of adjustment could be done. So you hear on you hear on a 9.5 radius bends on the high E at one millimeter as for action, or just over one millimeter, fraction over one millimeter, tend to start to zizz. You hear it. Now it only zizzes when you get to the top of the hill, and that's what I tried to explain to Alex in an email this morning is if you see it in 3D. Let's just exaggerate this. You've got a hill on this fret that you're bending against, okay? You're driving a string up and over or up to the top of a hill represented by this fret that you're bending it on. So when when you start, when you fret that note there, that's, that's I'm still on the 12th, right? When you fret the note there on the 12th, your anchor point is on the same plane, basically, as your um, start your fretted note and so are all the points in between. If you just see that as a thin slice they're all in the same vertical plane. None, none of these are providing their level. Um, they're all in the same plane. Now what happens is as soon as you start to bend you're basically driving the string higher up a vertical hill. Right Now the string start point is further up the hill okay but the string's anchor point is further down the hill and it's now going from up to down, okay, which you, in a sense you think increases the playing, increases the gap. For example, if you were able to brace this fret up, then you'd say, okay, that's good because it increases the clearance. But because you're driving it up this hill, you're driving it uphill against another fret, which is also uphill, okay, and basically it gets to a point where the combination of you driving the note to the top of this hill, but the... Um, the point that is anchored is so far low that it, it cancels out the clearance. And it's I don't know what the mathematics involved here is, but there is a point on this bend where the discrepancy between the high vertical elevation of this here and the low cancels out any benefit of the gap clearance because the next one is so high relative to it and this now is so low relative to both those points is that it, the lowness of it has has scissor their way the, the clearance you need. Anyway, that's the point about it. It's in 3D. Think about it in 3D. So, guess what I'm saying is, uh, on 9.5 radius, let's just, let's just um, get this tuned one more time, sort of. Um, on a 9.5 radius, it's quite difficult to go below that 1.2-ish. I've lost my thing again. God, it's so invisible. There is, here it is, I've lost my note. Look out, remember it. Um, 
Now, if this was a 7.25 vintage radius, uh, I absolutely wouldn't bother trying to get a 1mm or even 1.2mm last spray action on the high E here. You just wouldn't get the bends out of it. it would, this would have to be a minimum of about 1.5. So in this case, I'm going to stay at 1.2. I can hear, as you can hear, Whip. let's call it the uh, ninth fret. Ninth fret bending on the ninth fret gives us that scissory zizz sound. Now, what I'd like to do is leave the action there. My plan would be to attempt to in fret leveling because we're removing some wear down here. Um, we can fret level, and in doing so, we can gently aim to remove that little scissory noise. Okay, um, and hopefully. The, uh, the benefit of the fret level is we will have um, we will just clean up that bend on a very low action on a Telecaster for a 9.5 radius. So we'll, that will be one benefit, um, and, I, and how I've, I've basically lowered the action just slightly. So we'll get we'll get clean playing notes out of a, a very low uh, action for a Tele. Um, but also the side benefit is that we'll get. We'll remove the fret wear down at this far end as well, so that we'll get a kind of new, new feel out of our frets as well, which is a secondary reason for doing it. Now I'm just keeping the just tension on the strings here because it's easier than slacking it all off and just doing these frets all in one go. I don't mind getting pen on the strings. Hello, my love. Hey, look, it's she who must be obeyed from Shangri-La. No, where did she come from? It was Shangri-La, wasn't it? She. Lives and loves of a she-devil. Kind of. No, no. You remember um, Sean Connery and oh, whoever it was went to. Sh where did they go to Shangri-La? Mrs. Um, Overall with a cup of tea. All right then. Um. Uh, did you know? Uh, uh, shall I turn the camera off? No, it's a secret. No. Okay. Did you know that you haven't had any breakfast? Oh. Did you know that, audience? Uh, and it's what time is it? It's, yeah, two o'clock. I know I'm bad. I must stop and get some lunge. Michael Jackson. Lunge? What? Who's bad? Who's bad? I'm bad. Yeah. yeah. No Bolly. No. All night. Okay, so Morris's mum has vanished again for a few days. She went for a day and she went for four months, came back for about a month, and now she's gone for a day and another day. Stay in the day. night in the day. So she's voting with her paws, bless her. Oh, yeah, but she does come back. When she feels like it. No, I'm afraid that last night's, no, the, yesterday's um, vol didn't make it, I'm afraid. Volari. No, he didn't make it. Anyway, so um, here we are with the, the, the truss rod adjudicator, the banar -nar. Um And those who have seen this before know how it works and why. Um, I did mention earlier on then the business of why this works and I, I still do get lots of people kind of questioning and go you're, you're talking crap it can't possibly work yeah 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 and all that stuff and I don't want to argue about it please because it does work and that's why I do it <sighs> and other people who have tried it out also write to me and go oh shit yeah it works because they've tried it out and they found guess what it works so it does work and, and there's a very good logical reason otherwise I wouldn't have done it okay um, I'm not somebody who does stuff if it doesn't make logical sense. So with the neck, with our small amount of curvature in it that you've seen me set, I'm now going to, using the miracle of sort of laws of physics and these three little brass points, which are all pretty much, not pretty much, they're all exactly the same size. I'm going to use those little three thingies and this bar and its curving properties to line me up to mimic the curve or mirror the curve in that neck as it currently stands there under load. Then I'm going to slightly slacken off a little bit the tension which is yes it's a flaw okay in the system but it's not so much as makes too much of a difference. Then by the power of Greystoke and the um, my almighty gravity I'm going to waggle what I call the banana for very sort of cheeky, cynical reasons. But anyway, um, what I call the banana fret leveling tool, which is a truss rod with some self-adhesive sandpaper on it. I'm going to waggle that up and down for a bit, and then I'm going to stop. And if you want to take a look ahead with me down memory lane, 
you will be able to see with me what's happened. So we are cutting, we are cutting, you can see a little dark, you may be able to see a little dark chip there where we've still got a groove. The pen has gone into the groove and it'll stay looking dark until we get down to the bottom of that groove, which we'd like to do because that's part of the point of doing this. But we're cutting here, cutting here, hardly, a bit, a bit, some, hardly, quite a bit, 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 hardly, some, hardly, 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 some, some, some. Now the first diagnostic for using this tool, which takes a good few goes of getting used to it and what it's telling you, but once you get it, it makes sense. That's telling me that I've actually calibrated it correctly and the tool is currently following exactly the, um, the shape of the neck and it's taking off a small amount of material, which is the two things we're aiming for. I want all the notes to play clearly. I want the bends to play cleanly. I want to get rid of that little bit of sizzing noise on the ninth fret. And I also want to clear up these little grooves. Okay, so those are three agendas. First one you can tell straight away. Does it play all the notes? I would say yes. Um, has it cleaned up all of that groove, all of those grooves? Not quite. And have we got freed up that bend? Well, I won't know because I won't know until I've leveled some frets right in this. G track as I call it because we push it only it only runs into problems when we push it across. We still expect it to zizz out a little bit. But I'm gonna do a little bit more here because do I want to no it's not in this track. No I'm I'm okay with that. I'm not gonna do any more in that track. I'm gonna now move straight to the second track. I use the same calibration for that because I can't um, I, don't, I don't have room on the fingerboard to readjust it on the back side of the E, so it's going to use the same same setting as I used for the E. It's as close to being in the B track as you can get without being in the B track because the string's currently there, and so it gets in your way. But anyway, it's close. So I just work on this B now for a bit, and I do the same diagnostic look looky through, cutting, cutting pretty much down, got rid of the groove there. There's a tiny little groove still left in there, which polishing might get out, tiny bit there. I'll just kind of concentrate on that a bit more. Cutting all the way, not much has missed it. There's a low fret there, which the point being low frets make the following frets high. Um, so you're always governed in effect by your low fr lowest fret. Um, I'm just gonna do a little bit more on here to make sure this chip in that top fret there is gone. And I'm, I'm kind of just holding it there more to focus on it than anything else. I'm, I'm still hoping to let gravity do most of the work. I don't want to start pushing hard on this thing and deforming it. Um, so gravity is doing its wonders. And that's pretty much cleared that up. So I, I know that that's going to... Checklist. Has it cleared the groove? Yes. Does it play? Yes. Does it bend? The, well, have we cleared the E bend up to there, but it's still just wincing out on the G track, which is what we're now going to adjust. Now, because I'm now on the G track, I'm now going to recalibrate. I use the same spots on the neck to do it. Somebody quite, some very nerdy person, almost as nerdy as me, the other day asked a very good question. By the way, first of all, either, I can see from here, either the rod has straightened out a little bit or the um, neck relief changes a little bit at this point of the radius which is entirely possible so it's not curved enough just yet so I'm going to recalibrate to make it work for this strip that I'm working on I don't assume that it's the same curve on the neck all the way through anyway somebody pointed out really bright eyed and bushy tail pointed out hey man you could be placing your truss your little brass feet onto an uneven fret marker and they're quite right and actually yes it would make a small difference and yes it could account for a, can't stay somewhere right could account for a very small variation um, so it's a good point and you you know if you see you've got a wayward sticky uppy fret marker then you could avoid it um, most of the time I it doesn't make enough of a difference that I've ever noticed. It's pretty accurate. The accuracy is so good 
relatively speaking, that that it, it have never put the uh, the little I've never noticed having put the little units down. I've never noticed um, it being so far off the mark that we don't get a good fret level out of it. Okay, so I'm spotting a low fret up here, which has not even been touched. Everything else is a little. We've got a little bit of wear still in this early first two frets on the G, which doesn't tick my have we removed the wear box. So, for the sake of cosmetics and part of the reason of doing this, I'm just going to kind of concentrate. Now you notice I'm, I'm sort of working on the. the the, what I call the G track, which is where the G string itself kind of sits most of the time, but I'm I'm working the rod kind of either side of it because I know we we're not we don't want to just create little grooves all the way down. Okay, that's taking that. The first fret's good. The second fret's got the tiniest little thing, but that's so small that it would probably come out in the sanding process. So I'm not going to hammer away at it just yet. So we go back. Have we taken most of the grooves away? Yes. Do all the notes play for the very low action we've set? Tiny little bit there. And that's because that fret is low. Which is made, uh, I, you probably can't see it, but that fret I pointed out as low is actually making the fret in front of it make that noise. It's very, very slight. And that's the result of the low fret. Um, now, the question is, does ninth E bend nearly clean. It's very close to being clean but I am going to do a tiny fraction more on the G track so I'm going to clear that last bit of... Um, actually I'm going to do something Whoops! just before I do that and this is a good thing to do. I'm going to recalibrate on the G and my recommendation if you ever try this method is there are not... you, there are, you can't recalibrate too many times. Just do it. It doesn't hurt. The more the more accurate you are, accurate you are, the better. That's fine. Still good. But if you have, even if you, my recommendation is if you do your first pass and you see it's cutting only at the ends or only in the middle or it doesn't something it's not touching everywhere at some point, then recalibrate. You may find it's still only cutting at the ends and that may be entirely because only the ends are high and the middle just happens to be relatively low compared to everything else but just recalibrate go back and check it make sure it hasn't un undone in the, you know in the process or it hasn't bent out of shape or something or you haven't got it wrong or mis misjudged it the first time so i'm just i'm just taking that down to get to this low or to just bottom out this fret that was causing a, a high fret I'm going to draw something on here. Okay, that plays. Ah, so does that bend and it hurts. Okay, starting to get mucky here and it's also getting mucky on this pit guard, but that's fine, we'll clean it up. So we're now onto the D track and again recalibrate for the D. Um, now this is sitting on top of the, the marker, but I can see that it's very flushly done on this guitar. It's not like it's been glued and dropped into a hole. Now, if anything, that's probably now fractionally too curved. So, it's a tiny slack off, but the adjustments are absolutely tiny. And then that's too much. So, you wouldn't even be able to measure with your eye, you wouldn't be able to register how much or little I was changing the curvature on here. It's that precise. And if you think about that tiny precise adjustment, and oh, no, this isn't, doesn't want to stay out of the way. If you think about that tiny precision adjustment, you, you start to, when you realise how, how small amount of adjustment you make, you start to understand how tiny the amount of clearance is uh, for a low action like this. Now, you see I'm using a string to just hold that out of the way since I can't hold it, or it won't drop into one of the slots just now. So I'm just kind of lightly doing the D track now, just watching what happens, looking looking for the sort of telltale evidence of how it's cutting. And of course it's it's slightly cutting the top of the fret uh, all the way and that's good. And again we've still got this flat, this low one up here which may make the following one feel higher. Um, most of the, there's a tiny bit of, um, tiny bit of a, a notch, no, a groove still in the G 
track there, which I'm going to keep my eye on when it comes to the sanding part. That's good. I'm going to hold off there. Key, the key benefit, and I mem remember I said earlier on that there are some obvious benefits of this method. One of them is that it's because it levels with the actual uh, longitudinal compression of the string loading at play while you're leveling, um, so that it, that that same compression will be that you have when you're playing is now there affecting whatever it does to the frets. So that's now we're leveling with that. Oh, see, I always do this. Bust my nails. Um, we're leveling with that at work or taking effect because that makes it more accurate. I don't know. Make it up 10% more accurate or 5% more accurate than the passive fret leveling, neck leveling, passive neck, flat leveling method. Um, but the real benefit of this is because it's actually sort of less less obvious. It's because the strings are on. Um, you can do a bit of leveling, stop and play, and st and basically stop leveling at the exact point that you've freed up the action or free, freed up the. Yeah, the, the, you, you've, you've taken the frets to a degree of levelness suitable for the action you've chosen. And that's that's what, sets to me, sets it apart from the other method. The other method is a bit arbitrary. You're, you're either aiming for an absolute levelness with, with your fret rocker or your sanding beam, which is pretty costly in terms of it'll take as much fret metal away as, as is needed to... Um, reach absolute levelness and the truth is you don't need absolute levelness yeah you see that's that the highest bends there that's the limitations um, I'm not going to. Well, I, I might just address the G track a tiny fraction more in a minute because it's only be, mainly in this case because it still has that tiny groove in it. Um, but you, you see, you're hearing there the limits of what you can do with an ultra low action and a 9.5 inch radius. And I have to be realistic about that. Um, that on a Telecaster with a 9.5, you're probably not going to get a 1.0 uh, first fret. Sorry, 1.0 low. A 1.0 millimeter last fret high E action because of the geometry issues that I uh, mentioned before. So I'm just recalibrating to get the E track right, and then once I've done that, I'll recalibrate back on the the G and see if we can just. I mean, we you know sometimes you get it on the rare occasion. Everything, all things will be precise enough, and as usually by some inexplicable combination of factors that I, you know, I say would be hard to explain why. Um, but what you, what I can tell you is on on certain things like an Ibanez with very flat radius, uh, you can get an astonishingly low action. You know, you could easily get a millimeter on, on both sides uh, on an Ibanez wizard neck. No problem at all. Uh, you can also get that out of a pretty much any SG as well. Um, great. I'm going to just do. I'm going to do two things now. I'm going to do the G again and the A. Yeah. So on a on a on an SG, you can even uh, an SG is typically a 12 inch radius, something like that, but. So that helps, and and uh, and um, an Ibanez is very often, um, you know, something like an, an a 20 inch or very flat, 16 to 20 inch, something like that, or 18. Anyway, they're very flat. So as soon as you go flat, you can get a lot lower action out of it because of the issue I've talked about. Um, and an SG with a 12 inch radius is is can actually go a lot better than. And a Les Paul with the same radius, and the reason for it, I found, is that the SG, all of the bending neck, adjustable neck, is out of the body, and so you get, it gives you a smooth curve, all the way along, um, 
all the way along the neck and and so the neck because it's it's free of the constraining body unlike the les paul um it it seems to bend in one continuous and very accommodating curve and somehow that and the 12 inch radius makes it very amenable to an extremely low uh first uh, low, sorry low last fret action which is great so I love setting up SGs because they just behave. Yeah, let's just clear that up. Okay, and it's taken away our stuff. So you've got to be courageous enough to stick with it. I'm going to do, do the A here again because that was just a little bit noisy for my liking. Um, you, you, can, you can achieve an awful lot if you just sort of hang in there long enough and actually, if you use this method, I, I do have to say that even even when you think you're taking away too much material, you're still probably well on the right side of the uh, the other method, the flat passive neck, uh, passive flat passively flattened neck leveling method. So even when in using this method, you feel like you've gone a long way. You, you really haven't taken anywhere near as much metal off the frets as, as if you were scraping your way down here with a great big sanding beam um, or for that matter a radius block which is just completely kind of all out destructive I mean anyone who uses a radius block for leveling frets I mean I know it may, kind of makes sense because it feels like it's easy you go oh look um, oh, 9.5 yeah <sighs> everything's 9.5 job done true but you'll have taken off tons of more metal than you need to so remember all of this precision right is about one thing and one thing only it's about taking only as much metal off these frets as is required to make them play at the low action that you or your customer wants right and that's the that's the whole purpose of this it's not we're not chasing anything else other than that we're dictating the action and we're using this method to make the action work make the, the frets work with the action that we've chosen. Using a using that radius block to do it is a kind of a clumsy, relatively clumsy way of doing it and it's quite arbitrary. You're just you're making everything flat for the sake of it. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, I'm going to take this off, take these strings off off camera and I'm going to clean this up a bit and then I'm going to mask it all off and uh, I'm going to get on with the sanding process off camera because it's really dreary. Um, and I use three grits, three grades of paper. I use 600, 1000, and 1500, followed by a micro mesh set which goes from 15 through to 12,000. And once I've done that, this neck will be the frets will be then polished back into playing condition. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to re before I sand. I'll do the obvious thing, which is the re crowning or just rounding off these frets so they're no longer flat. Then I'll sand it smooth to plain condition. Um, and then I will hang it up because it will need we will need to wait for the new pick guard before we change that out. Um, but the nice thing about this is once we've done that we can then replace a new set of strings on here and the neck will return not only to its to its shape, which is a certain amount of curvature, but it will also, because we're refitting nines, it'll also reassume the kind of relative levelness as imposed by this horizontal or longitudinal compression which isn't factored in if you level your frets relative to each other with the neck passive and unloaded okay and that can't keep stressing that so we'll we'll come back when i'm ready to change this out and then once that's done we'll just put the new strings on and then it'll be a case of fine tuning test playing and setting the intonation um and meantime i'll also check whether this um could benefit from a second I think it can but I just want to make sure it's okay with Joe before I stick a, a hole in um, the headstock to put the second one in he may not need it but it's, it's entirely up to him the nut is okay I'm going to leave the nut as is it's been carefully worked we've now tweaked it a tiny bit and we're ready to go okay so I'll see you probably tomorrow when the pit guards arrive and we'll get on with that okie dokie I wouldn't normally rejoin you at this point but miraculously it's gone dark again we are where we started yesterday and i'm just finishing the uh 
fret polishing the part. <coughs> and we're down to the 6, 8, now the 8 and the 12,000, which is just the shining bit. Morris is on the stool over there, having a little sit down. <coughs> and I took a break from doing this earlier on, because I had a potential customer come over to try out a bunch of travel guitars and uh, it was very nice to meet him he's in a actually fairly successful band that plays a lot overseas and um, just put a perfect kind of customer for my Oakcasters <coughs> so he was really really liked one of them in particular liked all of them but he liked one of them in particular so I think we're probably going to sell him one. So he's going to have a, a think because he's planning his equipment strategy for the next tour and so on and so on. So perfect sort of scenario for me. Um, what, what matters most of all to me in selling those guitars, guitars is to find them, find people who they really suit. <coughs> um, you know, it's, it's a, sort of the perfect sale situation so that both the customer and I are happy with the sale. We know we're both happy and that's the that's the best situation you can get. Um, and they're not cheap so it makes sense to be really sure about it. So I'm very happy that he came and tried out a series, a few, and um, went away with a particular one in mind to kind of have a not cooling off exactly, but just think through, and which will make, if he buys it, make the decision all the more correct for him, which is excellent. And the thought of it, one of mine, another one of mine, being out there playing in the world of big venues and fairly large-scale gigs is uh, is great. <clears throat> really pleased. Not not least because it's, you know, it's great to have. We've got guitars out there doing the business <coughs> um, so that other people get to see them as well. So I'm just going to use some naphtha now to clean all this off. And basically I'm not going to carry on anymore today because it's time to park this and uh, leave it hopefully I think till tomorrow only when the um, replacement pit guard comes in. And then it should be a, a simple matter of switching it over at the same time as curing whatever's rattling underneath the hood there, which is really annoying. But this is nice, got all the pen and all the dust off. Um, get, remove it from here as well. It actually sinks into that pit guard quite a lot. That's actually some few marks from the, um, the pen. I don't know quite how that came off, what it came off with. But on there. Probably get off a bit of cellulose. Thinners. Very quick, judicious use of. Anyway, there we have the frets. Nicely leveled uh, or polished and also softened off so they're not scratchy anymore. Which is one of the things I promised they would do. <coughs> I'm also marked up for the second string tree for whenever that's going to go in. So, yeah, I'm going to just take take off that little bit of pen mark there and then I'm going to park said guitar until tomorrow when the uh, the new pick guard comes in. In fact I might just leave it and we'll, we'll clean that once it's off. Okay there we go. Done for today. See you tomorrow in the daylight. Well I've jumped the gun there a little bit. Um, I've changed the pick guard over for this beautiful new black one and I'm now just doing the stringings um i was on the skype to my dad so i'm afraid i didn't carry on filming this um but it's tail end of a nice well not a bad sunny day considering it's the end of the summer and um, i'm just basically restringing now ready for uh stretching out the strings and intonating them and tweaking the position of the pickups a little bit and then I've sent an email to Joe asking whether he wants the second um, string tree in or not. In which case, if he does, then I'll just add it in uh, a slightly later date. But right now, it's 
it's obviously not critical to get it in it's just possible i'm just gonna cut these short so the main thing at this stage in the game as i mentioned before having done the um I take, by the way i've taken everything off here i had a look underneath to try and find if there's anything um, loose that was causing the buzzing that I couldn't find anything so I'm just hoping that taking it out and putting it all back in may have kind of steady uh, calmed it down a bit um, but the main thing about this stage now having having done the precision fret leveling with the guitar set up with nines on it um, previously as soon as we reload the, the, uh, the, the load on or put the load back onto the neck with these new strings uh, the neck will revert to the exact configuration that we had it in when we were doing the leveling, which means um, it'll go back to being incredibly relatively level. Um, and that's a nice bit. It means we don't we don't have to kind of do any setup. It's already going to fall back into that position um, very nicely into that position. So I have taken the saddles off the the bridge just now to clean it up and to check underneath it. And also I've. Uh, I put some shielding on the underside of the pick guard, <coughs> which it didn't have before. So I've put some sh some foil shielding on the underside around the um, neck pickup, and I've also connected that to the conductive pickup, uh, conductive paint in the pocket routing in there, so the two sort of uh, the two connect up to make the shield complete. Um, um, but I so I didn't find anything loose in there that. I could see that would be causing rattling but obviously to clean it all up I've taken the bridge off as well um, to check in that pocket there was nothing really obvious in there that was rattling um, but in, to, to get the bridge off I had to take the saddles off so I've taken those off cleaned them up and put them back on as well as cleaning the plate so everything's cleaned up but um, it just means that I will have moved the saddles a bit in terms of their intonation position but in terms of their action they're exactly the same then I took them off in the same put them back on the exact same order I took them off so the action won't have changed but the intonation probably will have but I was going to set that from scratch anyway so it's not a problem okay so um, remember I was saying earlier on a critical thing about uh, making sure your guitar plays in tune stays and plays and stays in tune is getting the nut slots right but the other half of it is this thing about wringing all of the slack out of the strings and I've shown this several times before millions of times before but I use a thumb and forefinger technique which doesn't load these anchor points too much and I just use this to stretch that length of string and then a bit on the other side uh, on the string on this side as well but I use quite a lot of force on it and it's to really to get as much of the slack wrung out as possible. I do this for every string, go up and down, and you really can feel it loosening up as you pull the slack out of the string. Now obviously there's a little bit of um, stored slack going around the posts and that will take a few minutes of stretching and pulling uh, in different ways to kind of loosen out of the string, but we will kind of concentrate on doing that make sure it's all out because if you do that your guitar will start out being in tune and it will stay in tune so that's the first time I'll now get a note from this guitar here Now we'll tune it there quickly um, and then go through it again, stretching out the string very deliberately and very quite forcefully. Um, please don't listen to anyone who tries to convince you that this isn't worth doing. Um, I've, if you're going to take advice on what, when or how and when a guitar stays in tune, just bear in mind that I've done this now 400 times, I've seen 400 plus different guitars come through the Reload Guitars workshop and 
every single one that came to me with people saying I can't get it to stay in tune I have fixed the nut and then I've stretched out the strings and lo and behold when they get the guitar back it stays in tune miraculously perfectly in tune and it's like a miracle well it isn't it's very simple um, but you've got to do it and oh shit I've just I've worn out the batteries overnight brilliant Yeah, so it's not rocket science, but it does make sense. So we have the nines on here. Actually a tiny bit of relief. So I'm going to do a bit of stretching here, long ways, just to... That, that kind of stretch is a bit off the post, um, which you can't kind of get just by doing the fingers and thumb stretching so it's a little extra then I'll go back in a second to a fingers and thumb approach and you can you'll hear straight away this is yet again out of tune now I've quite forcefully done it three times now and it's still giving up some slack which makes which is what makes your guitar go out of tune um, and please you know, like I said this is such a simple fix um, I still have it in the back of my mind, some guy who came on YouTube and just kind of ranted at me about it not being ridiculous or being stupid to have to stretch the strings like this. It's just, it's proof. I've proven it hundreds of times in a row. This is not stupid. I've got guitars that people, like this one, people have sent me after having the strings on for and being played in their homes for years sometimes and I can still pull out the slack that's in the strings because it hasn't been stretched out this way. And it's just proof that normal play often won't get the residual slack out until you come to do a bend. And then the It'll either pull a bit of slack out of the your string where it's stored, or if you have um, gripping, sticking nut slots, it'll pull an even uh, equalised tension on either side of the nut. And it'll, when it equalises, what happens is it detunes. And of course the other thing, as well as stretching it out now, I'm going to do some big bends, if you can do them. Because you can also hear where, at which point, um, your strings are just slightly choking out if the action's still a tiny bit too low. I say this hasn't altered, but it may, when we check it now, still pretty much staying in tune there. When we check it now, we may find that this, this is fractionally out of tune. Uh, sorry, uh, fractionally high on the action, which case I'll do a minor, a little tiny tweak now um, as a sort of last thing. I want my other glasses on for this. Okay, so this is like last tweaks, and then I will go inside and get my tuner um, to do the intonation because it's in there now. I can't really see very well at the moment. Why is the light so crappy? Still is really. Mm, shadows are all wrong. Uh -huh, about 1.5 on the dot. Just over one, one, one on the dot. One, just under one. So yeah, we're kind of a little bit lower than I'd want to be on these. So I'm going to try and. Raise everything up a sort of quarter turn 
uh, give it, take it to where I think it should be for this telly. See, choking out on that, on the, it's a 9.5 radius and that, at one millimetre, uh, 1.1, 1.2 millimetres, you can hear that. Oh, at a tone and a half bend at a, around the middle, we're just scissoring out. So it's telling us that 1.2 is going to be too low for this. Um, and it's not really a fret levelling issue, like I said before, it's a diminishing returns on the tightness of the radius. Um, and there's not really anything, any way around that, it's a mechanical constraint. There's, a, there's no amount of flatness that will, uh, account or, that will cater for the curvature in the radius. thing here. I'm going to make a very small adjustment. Is this the right one? I can't remember. A very small adjustment on the uh, it was only yesterday I did this but I've forgotten which one it is. It's not that one is it? Where's it gone now? What have I done with it? Um, Big, surely. Yeah. Where's the bigger? Lost them somewhere. Uh, maybe here. Come on. Which one is it? This one. the one I think I've lost it which is a bit weird it's not up there sorry about this delay let's just go back to this one I don't want to use this because it's a bit it was a Allen key hex key and I seem to have now lost it darn it's one of those let's take it on okay I'm gonna have to go on a little hunt for something that works because I can't find it no more. I'm sure it must have been one of these. Well, it's impossible to see down the end there. It's quite a long way in. I have a feeling it was this one, but... It's not... It's not, it's not going in. Oh, it's that one. Give me a little turn there. I'm just going to give it a tiny bit more relief because it's very, very flat still. That's it. A bit more stretching. Like I say, I'm going to have to go and get the tuner for the intonation but it's probably quite close to being on now all the time while you're doing this last bit of stretching and tuning you're listening out for pings at the nut and uh, that's to hear whether or not 
you, if you hear a ping, it tells you that the strings are catching in the slots. And um, if they are, then they're going to be messing up your tuning. quite close on the um, intonation but I'm going to go and get the tuner and we'll do it that way as well but okay so just just a quick stop we're looking good Let's get those fingerprints off here because it's such a nice evil looking black thing when the there are no fingerprints on it but it's almost impossible to handle it without getting fingerprints on it I'm going to also pull up the Pull up the uh, neck pickup, bring it up to within three millimeters of the uh, the strings when when held down, fully held down. Okay, nice, All right, beautiful. Just do the intonation now, and that'll be done. And then the only other consideration is whether or not we put in a second string tree here, which um. We don't necessarily want to pull all the way down, we don't want the angle too steep, but we do want it in a bit. Okay, all right, see you in a sec. Okay, so I'm just gonna <laughs> tune this. Now, don't mind that it's on its back. Right now, I'm supporting the neck what I'm doing is I'm using a tuner to check the actual physical length of the string. So I've got to make the, each string has got to be the right physical length for that neck. Putting it on its back with the neck supported like this doesn't significantly in any shape or form change uh, the length of the neck. Well, sorry, the length of the string. things anymore and drop them all the time. <laughs> okay, that's a little long, so was the A, so I'm just going to pull those back a tiny fraction. A tiny fraction with the main attraction. And we're done. this one up try and get a better note out of it but
we're going to move the A and the E back a tiny fraction more if we can. We may have to clip the spring slightly on the E if it's not going to play the ball. There's a little tiny bit more movement, but let's see. And I've lost my pick again. Oh, God. That's all I keep doing this last couple of days is losing this white pick. So I've already tightened something up. I'm going to untang untangle and do both of them. And I'm just going to trim down the springs on each one. And give me a little bit more adjustment room. Which is easy enough to do. As I do this, the saddle is going to just come loose and dangle free, which is no problem at all. Pull the thing out. Get me a, something to grab the screw with. Okay. Okay. Get my clippers. Take a little bit off the A1. A1. And a little bit more off the E1. further back in the position, something like that, and back on with the E. It's sort of difficult to get in here, so I'm just going to try and feed that on like that. Actually, comes to a point where it's going it's to potentially runs back onto the <coughs> onto the screw. In fact, it is sitting on the screw, um, which means it kind of kicks up. So we may just need to pull that down a bit, make sure it goes and sits properly. Now this will have introduced some slack back into it, which I could do without, but. fingerprints which after all of that hard work cleaning it up it annoys me immensely don't want fingerprints on there all right let's try the intonation again on these bottom two let's give it a little bit of a tug to stretch all the reintroduced slack out and then we're going to just ping this Behaving this um, intonation on these last two. <coughs> and keep, having changed this over and got this lovely clean pit guard on, I'm now getting fingerprints all over it, which is just annoying me. Bag's got polystyrene in it. Looks like a sawmill out 
Yeah. We got there. Let's just do these. Turn them once more. go done I'm just gonna now relish polishing this last bit of palm prints and fingerprints off here and it's going in a bag and it's never gonna come out until it gets packed away or I put a string tree on it and there goes a mosquito gotcha um, there we have it so take a bit of a while to get the intonation down on those last few um, which is quite interesting considering uh, sort of it runs onto the point where you're actually you pay the, the grub screw is actually standing pretty much standing on the screw down there to get that intonated but um, it's okay so long as we get there that's the main thing so there we have it made in Mexico Fender Telecaster um, sort of standard issue looking thing in most respects um, now we've got the nice replacement three ply black white black pickguard on it and um, we've got a realigned neck we've got a tusk string tree we've got balance across all the first fret actions being the same um, which feels very very light and we've got a lowered slightly lowered action as well even though it obviously it's constrained by the 9.5 radius so you know we've done it low as we can go which is lower than it was but low as low as you can go and still be able to bend the strings a tone and a half or a step and a half or whatever you want to call it um, which as I said on the on the uh, 9.5 radius or below is quite a challenge so there we have it Joe's guitar ready to travel back after the weekend I don't like to send towards the end of the week and <clears throat> I'll also put in the bag not this isn't Joe's bag but I'll just stick it in there for the time being the original no, that's not good. The original pick guard for future reuse if necessary. I'll we'll go back with it. So there we have it. Finished and done. Thank you for spending time on Joe's guitar with me. And see you for another Relove Guitars at the moment. I've got no other customer ones in, so if you want to get yours into me, give me a call or get in touch via social media uh, via the Relove Guitars Facebook page. Um, I'm happy to book things in well in advance. It suits me to. Uh, to have a, a calendar that's filled up rather than leave it to uh, kind of as and when it's much more uh, much more guaranteed to get your guitar done in a nice timely fashion too if you can book it in so um, if you're interested get in touch via facebook page just search for real love guitars on facebook or um, get in touch sam deeks all one word at real love guitars uh, no at, at gmail.com um, or sam at Reloved.guitars is another way you can get through to me. Alright, so thanks for watching. See you again soon. Bye.